In this letter, this individual wrote, You declare, my friend, that you do not hate the Jews. You are merely anti-Zionist. And I say, let the truth ring forth from the high mountaintops. Let it echo through the valleys of God's green earth. When people criticize Zionism, they mean Jews. This is God's own truth. Anti-Semitism, the hatred of the Jewish people, has been and remains a blot on the soul of mankind. In this we are in full agreement. So know also this. Anti-Zionist is inherently anti-Semitic and ever will be so. The Negro people, my friend, know what it is to suffer the torment of tyranny under rulers not of our choosing. Our brothers in Africa have begged, pleaded, requested, demanded the recognition and realization of our inborn right to live in peace under our own sovereignty in our own country. How easy it should be for anyone who holds dear this inalienable right of all mankind to understand and support the right of the Jewish people to live in their ancient land of Israel. All men of goodwill exult in the fulfillment of God's promise that his people should return in joy to rebuild their plundered land. This is Zionism, nothing more, nothing less. And what is anti-Zionism? It is the denial to the Jewish people of a fundamental right that we justly claim for the people of Africa and freely accord all other nations of the globe. It is discrimination against Jews, my friend, because they are Jews. In short, it is anti-Semitism. The anti-Semite rejoices at any opportunity to vent his malice. The times have made it unpopular in the West to proclaim openly a hatred of the Jews. This being the case, the anti-Semite must constantly seek new forms and forums for his poison. Now he must revel in the new masquerade. He does not hate the Jews. He is just anti-Zionist. My friend, I do not accuse you of deliberate anti-Semitism. I know you feel as I do a deep love of truth and justice and a revulsion for racism, prejudice, and discrimination. But I know you have been misled, as others have been, into thinking you can be anti-Zionist and yet remain true to these heartfelt principles that you and I share. Let my words echo in the depths of your soul. When people criticize Zionism, they mean Jews. Make no mistake about it. And this was written in a personal letter from Martin Luther King, Jr., and was published in the Saturday Review. In contrast to this great statement on anti-Zionism, we have the statement last week of Jesse Jackson, that Zionists, talking about Barack Obama, that Zionists who have controlled American policy for decades will lose a great deal of their clout when Barack Obama enters the White House. Of course, the next day, he recanted. He didn't say he was wrong. He just said he shouldn't have said that. He never backed off of his statement. And, of course, the Obama campaign comes running out saying, no, 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 we're not anti-Semitic. That can't be true. And yet the question remains, if he's not anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic, why does a leader of his stature continuously surround himself? He didn't have just one association with a known anti-Zionist, anti-Israel terrorist, but consistently for over 30 years they have had relationships with radical leftists such as uh, Edward Said, and uh, pictured here in, they're pictured here in a banquet, both Barack and Michelle Obama. Uh, they have... Uh, had a close relationship with, of course, with Bill Ayers. Uh, he's been on several, served on several boards with Rashid Khalidi. He tries to dismiss all of this, but there's a pattern here that is extremely worrisome. And not to mention the fact that uh, recently he's been touted as the Messiah by the head of uh, uh, the Nation of Islam, uh, Louis Farrakhan, uh, in, in a journal I have here. There's a news report on what they call Savior's Day. Louis Farrakhan, the Nation of Islam leader, spoke to a mass of his followers, and he spoke about Barack Obama. He said, quote, you are the instruments that God is going to use to bring about universal change, and that is why Barack has captured the youth, and he has involved young people in a political process that they didn't care anything about. That's a sign. When the Messiah speaks, the youth will hear, and the Messiah is absolutely speaking. And here we have a picture of Michelle Obama at a uh, function of the uh, Push Coalition 
with uh, the wife of Farrakhan, Mother Khadijah uh, Farrakhan, and they are uh, circled. And my question is, what respected American politician in any of our history has consistently and knowingly been associated or involved with known terrorists, anti-Semites, anti-Zionists, unrepentant terrorists, Marxists, and race baiters like Obama has? If there were a white candidate who had gone to a church where the pastor was a member of the Klan, who served on numerous boards and organizations with known white supremacists, whose wife was also connected with the same people in her business and law firm, and who had received the endorsement of the Aryan Brotherhood, the Ku Klux Klan, and other white supremacist organizations, he would be all but crucified and stoned in the public square. But the news media doesn't investigate anything, say anything. They just give him a clean sweep. So what are we supposed to do? Well, we must recognize as believers that God is in control. As dark as the political scene may look, the light of God's grace shines just as bright today as it ever had. And again, the Founding Fathers had wisdom for us in times like this. John Jay said, we must go home to be happy, and our home is not in this world. Here we have nothing to do but our duty. All that the best men can do is to persevere in doing their duty to their country and leave the consequences to him who made it their duty, being neither elated by success, however great, nor discouraged by disappointment, however frequent and mortifying. John Jay was a president, uh, was one of the presidents of the Continental Congress, first chief justice, contributed to the Federalist Papers, and was a founder of the American Bible Society. John Hancock, one of the first signers of the Declaration of Independence and also a governor of Massachusetts, said, whilst we are using the means in our power, let us humbly commit our righteous cause to the great Lord of the universe, who loveth righteousness and hateth iniquity, And having secured the approbation of our hearts by a faithful and unwearied discharge of our duty to our country, let us joyfully leave our concerns in the hands of him who raiseth up and pulleth down the empires and kingdoms of the world as he pleases. He too was a governor of Massachusetts. And Samuel Adams wrote that the man who is conscientiously doing his duty will ever be protected by that righteous and all-powerful being And when he has finished his work, he will receive an ample reward. Jeremiah 17.5 tells us, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. For he will be like a bush in the desert and will not see when prosperity comes, but will live in stony wastes in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitation. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and whose trust is the Lord. And that needs to be our focus, not on what is happening politically, but on the fact that God is in control and our trust is in him. And we should be reminded as we close that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. And when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. And we need to pray for righteousness in our government. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to go through this study, to be reminded of these principles, to see how they worked their way out in the uh, men who were not only dedicated to this country, but were first and foremost dedicated to you and the truth of your word, uh, which found expression in the legal documents in the founding of this nation. Father, we recognize that we are to serve you to the very best of our ability to be as involved as we can within our own spheres in civil government. But that is not the be-all and end-all. It is not our source of stability or happiness. It is only the sphere in which we are temporarily involved, and we need to have our focus on our destiny, our eternal home, and on how we can live today to serve you in light of that future destiny, that we be not discouraged by whatever happens and transpires in this next election. For we know that this world is passing away and that we are simply here to serve you, to proclaim the gospel, to be a witness in the angelic conflict, and to glorify you in everything that we say and do. And if we do that, we have done our duty, and we will hear you say, Well done, good and faithful servant. 
We commit these things to in our country and our nation to your hands. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.